So yeah, Ken, Ken reached out to me about, oh man, six months ago, right before I embarked on writing my second book, and while we were at the very beginning of starting a six-month-long, three-month house remodel. And he asked me if I would like to do, oh, and I have, I have two children under the age of four also. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And then as this thing kind of progressed longer and longer, I started thinking, this seems like more and more of a horrible idea because I wasn't sure if the house was actually going to finish in time to be able to get out here. Because my wife's Italian, and if I had abandoned her with the kids, the house, the goats, the chickens, and the whole ball of wax to come to Florida, <laughs> and hang out for three days with Ken. Um, if I came back home, the next time that I woke up, if I did, parts of my anatomy would be inside my mouth. So um, <laughs> luckily, we wrapped all that stuff up. She was a loving woman, but she, uh, uh, she has the, the uh, wrath of her, her Italian people down pretty well. So <laughs> huge honor to be here. Uh, like Ken mentioned, I, I've got a decent background in uh, nutritional biochemistry. I was a cancer and autoimmunity researcher way, way, way back in the day. I was also a former California state powerlifting champion. So I've always had a really powerful interest in human performance and health and medicine. I've tended to drive my boat much more in a, a direction headed towards um, health and wellness, I guess. Like I still am very interested in elite level performance. I, I work within the, the Naval Special Warfare community in some uh, athletic scenes. Um, but my heart is really in helping people who are facing life shortening or life ending diseases and trying to help them understand if they have some alternatives. And that, that's really what, what you know, fires my process. So I'm gonna start this off, I'm doing this a little differently. So you guys are kind of an experiment of one. So we'll see if this, see if this goes well. So how many of the, you folks in the audience have a smartphone on your person currently? <laughs> Virtually everybody. Okay, so cool, cool. Now, is that smartphone better than what it was 10 years ago? Yeah, like amazingly better. Is it cheaper? relative to the way that you could have bought that same type of phone yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's gotten cheaper and it's gotten better. Does anybody know what that process is? Things getting cheaper, things getting better. There was, there was this Moore's Law. Yeah, I heard somebody say it, Moore's Law. It's kind of like who's buried in Grant's tomb. Um, say who's Moore. Uh, he was a computer scientist in, in the uh, uh, early to mid 1960s, and he observed that uh, computer microprocessors tended to get faster and better, twice as fast, half as cheap, about every 18 months. And we've been on this kind of exponential process. It'll probably flatten out at some point, but in general, we, we see that process moving along. And, and it's interesting, this Moore's Law story goes across a ton of different fields, particularly as we're able to bring information processing to bear on different situations. The Human Genome Project, there was a time when, when uh, uh, sequencing one megabase of DNA cost more than a million dollars. And now it's like a few pennies. It's incredibly inexpensive. So we know more about genetics and biochemistry and type 2 diabetes. So, so here's another, another little diversion along this. How many, so I, I put into a, a, the United States website, the, the um, PubMed, the National Institutes of Health website, where you can search about different health topics. And in that search, I put in type 2 diabetes, and I put a, a filter for the last five years. So now, English language primarily, last five years, type 2 diabetes. How many peer-reviewed citations do you think there were? 110,000. But still, how many of you have the time to read 110,000 research papers? I mean, it, it, so, so could, could we argue that, you know, and there's some back and forth on whether or not science is being particularly well done these days. I don't know if you guys have, have stayed up on some of that, but I would argue that we probably know more about type 2 diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, than we've ever known in history. Does anybody know what the rates of these diseases are? If we were to to graph them, are they flat? Are they going down? They're going up. Can anybody describe the type of up that they're doing? It has exponential growth. Exponentials don't do well in biological systems. They end up causing really nasty repercussions. And for us, 
Uh, there's a very interesting paper done by the Congressional Budget Office, a very nonpartisan missionary style kind of governmental organization that is pretty non-controversial. And it puts a number at about 2050 that we will be spending about 300% of GDP on diabetes related issues alone. Now that's three, three times all of our projected productivity to deal with that one problem. That will not fill one pothole, pothole, educate one child, or deal with one other issue. Now my question to you is how on earth can we know more about everything that you would care to know about, but yet we have these problems that are literally going to the moon. How could that possibly be? The, lo the longer life is, is not it. It's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about, but they are not expensive. Generally, people don't, uh, uh, the, the expense, and it, this is an interesting piece within the uh, Congressional Budget Office, and I, I have those numbers in a different talk, so if the, if the geeks want to check that out, we can <laughs> grab some wine and check that out after the main talk. But in general, this increased cost is related to diabetes. Di diabetes and, and the obesity related to that. I'm going to go out on a, a limb and say that the reason why we have these problems is medicine is approaching the problem the wrong way. Amen. Period. Now, if we were tackling this like an engineering problem, engineers don't get in squabbling matches about whether you should use a triangle versus a hexagon, rebar versus balsa wood. It's been very, very narrowed down and, and, and figured out. Medicine, and this is somewhat opinion-based, but I, I've got some pretty good uh, facts to back this up. When medicine discovered antibiotics, it was a golden age. These antibiotics changed everything. People used to die in the millions from simple infectious disease, and this was magic. People were saved in the millions. But it was so powerful that it oriented medicine towards a single cause or single etiology and a single cure. And that is simply not the case with the modern Western degenerative diseases. Cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, senile dementia. These are chronic issues and they do not lend themselves to an acute phase solution. And I am an absolute nutcase optimist but I'm also very, very knowledgeable about the complexities of biology, and you will not fix complex solutions like this with a single pill or a package of pills. What you will do is bankrupt our, our country in the process of trying to chase that process. So what I'm gonna sell you guys on, if I do an effective job of it, is this idea of Darwinian medicine. We need to get some, some evolutionary biology, some evolutionary perspective into our medical systems, into our healthcare systems. And this approach does not provide answers. What it does is it orients questions. Currently, we are not even asking the right questions to get a right answer. That's how far away we are from. So what this methodology can do, if we implement it properly, it will orient our scientific investigations in a way that we can start asking the right questions and then move towards the correct answers. So I'm gonna kinda move this thing forward a little bit. What, what, did, does anybody who clearly, if you answer this question, it indicates you have no social life and don't get out a lot, but <laughs> what are the foundational tenets of, of physics? Newtonian mechanics, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, those types of things. Yeah, it's not a lot of controversy around that. Most people know that. What are the guiding tenets of biology? Evolution via natural selection. Theodosis Dobzhansky observed that nothing in biology makes sense except via the light of evolution. Medicine is a sub-branch, or I would argue, is the application of biology. But yet, there is virtually no evolution training no orienting, no epistemological framework that's offered with, with that kind of evolutionary biology couching for most physicians. And I, I just gotta ask, and I get this a lot, are humans exempt from evolution? And it, it's really, it's a, it's a funny, it seems funny, but in, in polls, and this stuff gets really contentious, like I, I, I can get chased out of town depending I, where I am when I talk about this stuff. But, um, 
people are much more comfortable talking about the evolution of ants and elephants than they are people. And so sometimes you kind of have to do a little bit of a circuitous route towards getting in on this. I will say this up front, though. Um, somewhat like a superior operating system, this evolutionary medicine, this ancestral health model is out there. And it's working. And it's changing ideas. It's changing the way that things are happening. Um, if, how many people remember the old DOS interface on a computer? <laughs> How much better is an Apple product or even a standard PC today? These are technological innovations. These are essentially operating systems which drive innovation and drive the ability for people to interface with a process. And this evolutionary medicine ancestral health model is changing medicine. Now, it's not necessarily going to be a top-down activity. This is largely a grassroots activity. It's very driven by social media. But uh, Stanford, Harvard, uh, the Cleveland Clinic are all now certifying their doctors in evolutionary medicine and or functional medicine, which functional medicine is kind of a trumped up term for evolutionary medicine. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, 15 years ago is when I got into this around 1998, and none of this existed. Uh, having a talk like this could have never occurred. So it's really a fascinating time for me and very, very exciting. But you know, my, my case with a lot of this stuff, if we look at the early human timeline, um, and there's, there's contention on the, the timeline with, with these things, but we had a huge amount of time that was spent as pre-human, eventually proto-human, and then we start getting into our, our actual genus of Homo, and we have Homo sapien and, and Homo erectus uh, neanderthalensis living in a pretty brief period of time relative to the total genomic history of humanity. And then it, the, uh, one of my uh, mentors, Lauren Cordain, he has a really interesting analogy, which is that if you were to take a football field, one, one goal line to the other goal line, and you started at one goal line being the beginning of human history, and it's somewhat arbitrary how far back you want to go with that, but you know, we'll pick something that kind of makes sense, and you move all the way forward, how close do you think that we get to the other goal line such that it represents a, a period of time remaining that represents the last 10,000 years since agriculture has come into being? Yeah, like an inch. Yeah, almost nothing. So now, part of the, the, you know, what the implications are there is that we might, we might have a set of genetics and an expectation about food and exercise and socialization that we are wired one way and we're experiencing something that is completely different. And there may be problems associated with that. That is the crazy used car salesman pitch of evolutionary biologists and it's called the discordance model. You may be wired for one set of circumstances, you may be living in another set of circumstances, and it's the discontinuity in that co communication between your environment and your genes that may be causing a, a whole host of problems. So there's some interesting anthropological observations. And again, these are observations, but it's a fascinating place to start with. And one of my bugaboos about the current state of skepticism and evidence-based medicine is that observation is the beginning point of all scientific inquiry. We cannot just throw that stuff out. We also can't run pell-mell and throw our arms around it and accept it as fact. But it, it, Carl Sagan had a, a line that was something to the effect that if we're exposed to a new idea, we should be just, just incredibly skeptical of this new idea, but we should be so excited about the possibility of discovering what the story is one way or the other that we just tackle it and investigate it. And what I find today is that skepticism is merely a Wikipedia search away to see what the consensus is, and that's the end of the story. And for me, that's pretty frustrating. So anyway, we have anthropological uh, observations, and these observations were that contemporary hunter-gatherers who lived what we would consider an ancestral life way were largely free of modern Western diseases. Now, what does, what does this mean? We've had people living in and around hunter-gatherers and non-westernized populations since the mid-1800s. The, since the 1900s forward, we've had people living among hunter-gatherers, horticulturalists, uh, transitional agriculturalists, 
and doing biometric testing, which I'm going to show you some of that stuff, doing autopsies. So this isn't just a deal where some scientists walked down a forest path, looked over, and they said, oh, I guess those folks look healthy. Like, they actually lived in and among these people. And they were largely free of most of the chronic degenerative diseases that we see. Dental malformations, cancers, obesity, tuberculosis. They saw very, very low rates of tuberculosis amongst these people. They thought there might be something going on with the, the way that their immune system functioned. There was another observation, though, that a transition to an agrarian life way um, tended to cause a significant amount of problems for these people. The more refined the foods that these folks started consuming, the greater the problems they had. And what's really fascinating, you can go to any anthropology department at any university, ask some folks, hey, did hunter-gatherers kind of suffer some deterioration in their general health, well-being, infant mortality rates by shifting to agriculture? And the anthropology folks will be like, yeah, that's pretty well established. Did that further increase in severity as we industrialized our food system? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Now, you go over to the nutritional science department, and you ask that same question, and the people look at you wanting to know if you want to go talk to the anthropology department. And that's about as far as the interface goes. So it's interesting, this, this foundational understanding, like if you were an alien traveling from another world, landed here and looked at an organism, what would you want to know about it? What does it eat? How does it sleep? What's its reproductive status? Is it, does it live in a group? Like those things are really important, right? But yet from a medical perspective, we essentially forget all of that basic ecological steeping that makes humans humans. And it, it, I think that that's created a huge blind alley for the way that we can approach things. So I have this, this quip called the, uh, the Russian literature paradox. Um, people will freely comment about what their thoughts are on the anthropological observations related to, to human health with absolutely no background on the topic. <laughs> but imagine that we were in here talking about mid-18th century Russian literature, and I pointed somebody out of the crowd and I said, uh, young lady, could you please comment on the uh, syntactical change of mid-18th century Russian literature and give your, your thoughts on it? No. And, and why not? <laughs> so so an, honest, an honest statement there would be, I'm not actually well-versed on that topic. And what's fascinating, though, is that when you start proposing this particular, I, I do this talk frequently within medical systems and the, the kind of pushback is rather fascinating Then I kind of use the Russian literature paradox. It's okay not to know something about something. It is not okay to comment in a highly <laughs> certain, with much certitude when you don't know uh, uh, about a certain topic. But I, I, uh, I kind of like that thing. But really, he, here again is my greasy used car salesman pitch that kind of ties this whole thing through. Could changes relative to the ancestral environment cause pathogenic epigenetic signaling in us? And epigenetics is the way that our food and our environment turn our genes on and off. We, we, yeah, I mean, is that a crazy supposition? Now we need to go out and, and maybe find some information that starts fleshing this out. And, and what this means is just that we're born with a certain set of genetics, but our genetics are not our destiny. The way that we turn these genes on and off is what more determines in our destiny. How we sleep, how and when and what we eat, the social connectivity that we have, the gut biome that we carry within us, our, our own uh, uh, feelings of, of love, affection, connectivity, those are massively uh, uh, influencing in the way that our genetics are expressed. And this is one of the big problems that I have with some of the genetic testing, and I'll talk about this a little bit later when they tell someone you have BRAC1 gene, the breast cancer gene. I'm of the opinion that enormous number of these genetic diseases are only a disease if the proper epigenetic or environmental triggers are flipped, and virtually no money and very little education goes into that fact. And another fact that is completely missed, and I will talk about that later, that frequently people with these deleterious gene defects actually show evolutionary advantage. They tend to be healthier earlier in life, they have more kids, they fight off other infections, and it just happens that some of this benefit may become problematic later in life if we don't do certain things correctly. 
But the whole way that this thing is couched is of doom and gloom and, and uh, oblique understandings. And I, I really think that this evolutionary framework can, can help shed some light on stuff. So historically, we hunted and we gathered. And there's very little controversy around that. Um, we were incredibly active. Uh, pretty conservative estimates put that most humans walked at least about six to 10 miles a day, just in their general activities. And they lifted and sprinted and climbed and did all number of other activities. Um, but it was a pretty active life way. Today, we literally, and I, I work from home, like, it can get bad. I can sit in my underwear, type on my computer, order food to my door. If I want to get crazy and go like the colostomy bag thing, I can really save some time. But you know, I mean, <laughs> in, instead of walking miles a day, I can literally walk hundreds of steps. And it is crystal clear now that sedentism is, is in, it, as significant uh, an issue with regards to health as smoking, and this is really an amazing paper by Frank Booth in his lab. Uh, it's called Exercise and Gene Expression, Physiological Regulation of the Human Genome Through Physical Activity. It's, uh, it, they start off by asking the question, what is the normal human phenotype? What are we normally supposed to look like? And when we dig around in pre-agricultural societies, and, and folks that live closer to the earth and they're very active and they eat whole unprocessed foods, they look kind of like professional athletes. We are supposed to be essentially professional athletes. Tend to be lean, strong, good cardio, um, nothing super crazy by, by modern performance standards, but nothing really to, to laugh at either. And this was the norm. This is assumed to be the norm. This is the norm of every other active animal on the planet. We don't have bears and cheetahs and lions that look portly. They look <laughs> lean and athletic. The only other animals on the planet that look portly are our pets. <laughs> so here's what's going on with this. They, they make a model in which physical inactivity uh, silences certain genes that are supposed to be favorable, heightens other genes which may be negative, and we get an inhibition in what we would consider favorable expressions of proteins. And this is a genome-wide thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but it reaches a threshold of negative signaling that eventually leads to pathology. And it, it's, uh, I used to do uh, gene microarrays. It was super boring work, but they're kind of cool. You basically can map every protein that's being expressed within a tissue or the body. And what's really fascinating is you exercising you if we did a map of all the proteins that you make, basically the genes that are turned on and off, and then we did a map of sedentary you, you are literally a different person. You are not the same organism at all. And the, the basic argument that these guys make is that we just, we hit some threshold, and some people have better thresholds with this than others. We all know someone, you know, like an Uncle Fred that drank a bottle of gin a day and smoked and chased women till he was 90. That's not me. I would be dead in my 30s. Um, I, I came from the shallow end of the gene pool in that regard. I, I, I would not handle that well. So there's differences with everybody, but there's a basic trend here that there is some basal need for activity that helps keep us healthy. It's just woven into our genes. It's baked into the cake. Now, in, in the... I'll back up a little bit. The exercise piece when we talk about this evolutionary biology, ancestral health, hunter-gatherer type thing, even within medical circles, is very uncontroversial. People are like, yeah, okay, I totally get it. When we talk about what they actually hunted and gathered, all hell breaks loose. So um, I love this thing. So yeah, this is just so incredibly contentious and controversial, and it, it's really pretty crazy. Here are the basic principles of a, a paleo or ancestral diet. In general, and I'm, and I'm glad to fill in some details here, in general, it was grain, legume, and dairy-free. Not 100%. There's, you know, it, it, they will find, oh, the San Bushmen were using a type of bean. Okay, fine, you know, but, but th this is the general deal. They weren't getting the bulk of their calories from that. They got the bulk of their calories from seasonal local fruits, vegetables, roots, and tubers, 
lean wild meat, fish, fowl, and seafood, nuts and seeds, uh, macronutrients varied with the seasonal locality. If you live in a far northern climate in the winter, you're not eating bagel type stuff. There is no bagely type stuff around. You're eating protein and fat because that's all that's there at that point. So the, the macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat, cycled with seasons, cycled with location, and it all had to follow this thing called optimum foraging strategy, which you never want to talk about optimum foraging strategy in a state that receives funding for bioethanol because it's the same story. Um, you got to get more energy out of the system than what you put into it or it fails. And so optimum foraging strategy is basically the story of living as a hunter-gatherer, which a guy about my size would have burned about 4,500 calories a day being a hunter-gatherer, and females are right in there. It's, it's body weight match, but we were very active. We had to get our total caloric load from meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. And so there's some implications there about what the ancestral diet looked like. And we understand that our, our ancestors were as robust as they were because of uh, skeletal analysis. We can see the, the bone structure, and particularly the muscle insertions, are huge. These people were built like professional athletes. They were very, very, very active. Interesting, uh, uh, Neanderthals and Homo erectus were way more robustly built than we are. We started developing more culture and using our brains, which allowed us to expend less physical energy to be able to do things, but we were still no slouch. Our, our immediate ancestors were quite robust. They ate a lot of food, and these were the general things that they, they obtained that from. And this is a great paper from uh, Lauren Cordain, Plant Animal Subsistence Ratios, Macronutrient Energy Estimations, and Worldwide Hunter Gatherers. And if you guys are interested in all the references for this, I can put them all together and ping them to Ken, and then he can email them out to you. Super, super easy list. So here's what I'd, I'd like to propose is kind of a way that we can move forward, and it's the way that my research group has been tackling different, different topics, and it's something that I would encourage everybody to, to use as a way of looking at things. I'd really like to start this story from this anthropological observation. When we have a problem, let's start from anthropology and history and see if we can find any, any insights into it. And then we can start moving forward in epidemiology. The study of populations is the next bridge to that, where we can start asking some questions of that ancestral kind of story, see if we can find some epidemiological support. We can move that into clinical work, both animal and human models, and then we should be able to get some sort of a mechanistic validation of the process. But we start this again with that anthropological observation. We use this evolutionary medicine to ask the why. Then we start plugging it into our really powerful, robust question and answer process of, of modern medicine. But I, I'm arguing, and I hope I'm not redundant, but I also hope I'm clear on this, that we generally are, most of our research in my opinion, we aren't even asking the right question. We haven't even set the right stage to be able to get the types of answers that we need. So I'm going to walk you through how we, we uh, uh, can use this process to delineate some of the diseases of modernity, mainly uh, dyslipidemia, metabolic derangement, and also autoimmune disease. I'm going to show you how we can deconstruct that using this type of model. So we're going to go from clinical observation to molecular mecha uh, mechanisms. We're going to start with the Katavans. The gentleman on your left is a 100-year-old uh, Katavan. Uh, they, they live near Papua New Guinea. They're hunter-gatherers transitioning into horticulturalists, but they live effectively w without modern conveniences for the most part. Um, the, the other guy is being measured by uh, Stefan Lindeberg who's an MD, PhD at the University of Lund in Sweden. He and his family have lived in and among the Katavans for uh, off and on for about 20 years. He brings his whole family down there and they run these uh, uh, studies on them. And this is where he has actually done autopsies on, on some of the Katavans. So they have some really amazing data on these folks. And he uh, uh, did this thing called the Katava diet, not surprisingly. And I love the Katavan story because it pisses everybody off. I, it, I just, I, in one drop, I'm able to make everybody in the room mad because the diet just annoys everyone. So the traditional diet is yams, taro, bananas, fish, pork, and coconut. Uh, the macronutrients are about 60% carb. 
uh, 15 to 25% protein, and then the remainder is fat. The primary fat was saturated fat. So I love this. <laughs> so if you're one of the low-carb jihadis, and you think that carbs are going to give you diabetes overnight, then you're, you, you are horrified at a 60% carbohydrate diet. If you are out of the T. Colin Campbell um, forks over knives fantasy, then um, these guys should have cancer out, out the wazoo. And then if you buy into the American Heart Association idea of saturated fat being, being you know, Satan itself, they should have cardiovascular disease like, like you cannot believe. And we see none of that. They are completely free of Western degenerative diseases until they start eating modern food. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the macronutrients didn't change. The amounts of protein, carbs, and fat didn't change, but the qualitative nature did. Now, probably the last 50 years, the United States in particular, has been in this thing called the macronutrient wars. Is it a high-carb diet? Is it a low-carb diet? Which one's better? And I think that that has been one of the largest red herrings that we've ever had. Because if we're eating a largely whole, un unprocessed, what we would call ancestral diet, I would say in general, it just doesn't matter. Unless you are metabolically broken, in which case I, I would argue that a lower carb diet is probably better, but that's kind of a topic for a different, different discussion. But uh, what they noticed was that there was no real change in caloric content, no real change in macronutrient ratios, but as they started eating westernized foods, they started getting sick. And so Stefan Lindeberg formulated this idea. He had an idea about what might be at hand in this problem. And he thought that the change was a shift towards grains, and grains have these anti-predation chemicals on them that dissuade animals from eating them, and they tend to cause a lot of irritation to the gut. Gluten is a, a pretty good example in wheat. Uh, rice has a stuff called zine. Corn has a, a protein. I would say corn and, and rice are much less problematic across board, gluten being pretty problematic. But he, he basically asked this, uh, made a couple of statements and then asked a question made the statements, foods are appropriate for any given species if they were regularly consumed during most of its prior evolution. Plants protect themselves with bioactive substances directly aimed at animals, substances which may have untoward effects on long-term human health. Basically, everything in biology has horns and thorns or teeth or poison to protect itself. If it doesn't, it's a snack, and that, that's all there is to it. The uh, uh, Luther Burbaking of our, our fruit and vegetable supply dramatically decreased the bitter toxicants, which used to be part of our, our fruits and vegetables. We made them larger and sweeter. And, and now they're much more prone to pests, and, interestingly. So he asked this question, agrarian diet and diseases of affluence do evolutionarily novel dietary lectins cause leptin resistance? And make sure I've got all my, see if I can drag this up here. I do have a few notes I like to pull off. So yeah, the, the, the lectins are, Interesting, uh, we'll talk about lectins and leptin. It's really unfortunate that they're almost the, the exact same word. Lectins are sugar binding proteins. They're cell surface identifiers. Like when we do a tissue tra an organ transplant and it gets rejected, it's essentially lectin type molecules that, that alert the immune system that there's a problem. They're used in um, uh, some therapeutics uh, situations. Banana lectin has been found effective in certain strains of HIV-1. But some are pathogenic. Uh, uh, ricin is a, a main constituent in nerve gas, and that is derived from the castor bean. So there are, are uh, Bruce Ames, the father of modern toxicology, makes the point that all of nature is toxic. It's just dose and how well you're able to, to clear that dose. Now, leptin is an adipose-derived neurohormone. It basically tells us when we're hungry. Uh, it, it fluctuates in response to body fat levels, if our body fat levels are very low, then leptin should go up, making us hungry. And if body fat levels are high, it should go down, letting us know we're full. It kind of operates over the long term, but what happens when we chronically overeat, when we get chronically inflamed from poor sleep and poor diet, and also because of the biological activity of some of these lectins, they can actually bind to the leptin receptor and make it not work. So we could actually be full of food, yet still hungry. 
And that's a problem. Let's see here. Did I get all that stuff? Inhibits appetite, regulates insulin sensitivity. So leptin resistance tends to preclude insulin resistance. So the way that they tested this hypothesis, pretty, pretty slick. So they started off with an epidemiological study. They had a hypothesis based off of anthropological observations. And they tested uh, uh, 200 uh, Katavans and 200 Swedes. Make sure my notes on that are right. Yeah. And... Uh, they discovered large differences in serum leptin levels between westernized and non-westernized populations, the Katava study. Basically, the, the Katavans had um, super low uh, leptin levels, uh, so low that no one representatively was found to have the same type of levels in an age and gender match population of Swedish folks. So the Swedes were already leptin resistant relative to the, uh, to the Katavans. Now it begs the question, why? why? Why was there a difference there? And the implication would be the population with the high leptin levels is probably leptin resistant and therefore prone to overeating, type two diabetes, and a host of other issues. So the next one was an animal study, and I was actually the review editor for this. Um, Paleolithic diet confers higher insulin sensitivity, lower C-reactive protein, and lower blood pressure than a cereal-based diet in domestic pigs. So they basically fed meat, fruit, veggies, roots, shoots, tubers to some pigs, and then they fed a, what would be, be considered a, a pretty darn good Mediterranean-type diet, whole grains, low-fat milk, some protein sources. And what they found was that the paleo group had much lower C-reactive protein, which is a sign of systemic inflammation. They lost, excuse me, significantly more weight they had better phase two insulin sensitivity, which what that means is that the muscles themselves were insulin sensitive in this paleo diet group. And they were, they were otherwise calorically matched. So they're eating the same number of calories, approximately the same amount of protein, but there was something different there. One group had grains and legumes, the other one basically had meat, fruit, root, shoots, and vegetables. And the, the really of importance, there was no pancreatic leukocyte infiltration. Leukocytes are a white blood cell. When they infiltrate the pancreas, that is oftentimes the beginning of type 1 diabetes. And we're going to see how this process leads into autoimmune disease here in just a little bit. So further testing this hypothesis, they did a paleolithic diet in humans. Uh, paleo diet improves glucose tolerance more than Mediterranean type diet in individuals with ischemic heart disease. So these were people who had existing heart disease and or were already type 2 diabetics. They put one group on a Mediterranean diet, one, one group on a paleo type diet. The, uh, the black dots are the pre, the white dots are the post. This is the Mediterranean diet with about a 3% improvement in the oral glucose to tolerance test, barely statistically uh, significant. This is the paleo group. All the members of this group, and there were only about 14 people on each side, so not a huge sample size, but the people in this group were effectively no longer type two diabetics. And they were uh, each allowed to free eat the diet. So they were basically given a buffet type deal that they had to weigh and measure the food and track that, but, but they were essentially free eating folks. But pretty powerful change. And I would have assumed, so you can order this stuff out. I think it's very logical to order this out. If you're eating a complete junk food diet, and then you shift to something that looks even like not that great of a Mediterranean type diet, but you know, kind of emulates it. I would expect better results than that. I was actually shocked by that, um, just shifting towards whole foods. But it, again, it's pretty, pretty interesting. So here's where we are. Everybody still there? Anybody need coffee? Okay, we're hanging together. Okay, so we had a conspicuous lack of cardiovascular disease within this anthropological data. We asked why. Um, we went into a epidemiological study, the uh, Swedish versus Katavan study. The Swedes had very high leptin levels, which was interesting, but still doesn't answer any questions. So we started moving into some animal and human models, and we still see some consistency. We see some consistency that this paleo diet that seems to be lower in immunogenic proteins, lower in these proteins that plants use to defend themselves, People seem to be doing better on this. They're either spontaneously eating less or they have less inflammation or a combination. And so we're into the animal and human model and now we start getting into some of the mechanistic testing. This stuff might get a little bit thick, but I'll try to, uh, to go, 
go through it in a pretty reasonable way. Have you guys seen Alessio Fasano? He's been here multiple times. Um, amazing guy. He, he and his lab really elucidated the, the mechanism behind celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease triggered by the gluten or gliadin protein. I won't go into super deep detail on this, but essentially in, in uh, susceptible individuals, the gluten protein interacts with the epithelial cells, causes a release of interleukin-15 and zonulin. This opens up the tight junctions. Do you want your intestines opened up with poop all around it? No, you want to keep your poop where it is. Yeah, that's bad stuff. So what, what happens is large intact food molecules make their way into the, into the interstitial area, and we have a ton of this stuff called tissue transglutaminase. It's in essentially every cell, and it modifies just about every protein that is manufactured in every cell or tissue of our body, okay? It has a tendency to glom onto that gluten particle, and when they stick together, then our immune system recognizes it as a foreign invader and attacks it. So now you've got immune system activity against a protein that is in every one of your cells and is critical in making just about every damn protein you can make. Could that potentially be a problem? <laughs> yes. Uh, there's eight different isoforms of tissue transglutaminase. Regular medicine tends to test for one, sometimes two, but this is one of the, the absolutely um, heartbreaking elements of this uh, uh, celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity story is that it sounds like the person is crazy because everything from neurological symptoms to bowel function to bone issues is occurring. But we have a really well-documented mechanism for why that is likely to be. And you can easily dig up literature that, that tends to support this idea. But this whole leaky gut process appears to be necessary for autoimmune diseases to occur. There's other factors, but the, this, uh, this is part of what is, has been put forward. Um, I just wanted to throw this out really quickly. This is again, so uh, sometimes when people hear that someone has celiac or gluten intolerance, they say, oh, it, it's kind of perceived as a weakness. The reason why people react to gluten and, and gluten-like particles is because their guts are more on alert for infectious agents. People who have celiac or are prone to celiac tend to get fewer uh, gut infections. So it's a trade-off. If you have really, really strong immune response, you may not get many infections, you may not get cancer, but you may very likely die due to autoimmune disease. If you have a very dialed down immune response, you might die from an infection, you're never gonna get autoimmune disease and you could develop cancer. So it's a balancing act, it's a trade-off. But I, I pulled this one up, this is just a paper talking about the comparative evolutionary advantage of the celiac gene loci because it, it seems to confer selective advantage in situations where you're exposed to a lot of infectious disease. And it seems to have developed right when we started living in cities and doing agriculture. So we went from being exposed to not a ton of other people and other animals to a whole lot of them. Okay, not everybody gets celiac disease, but all grains have prolamines. Prolamines are these uh, uh, proline-rich proteins which are very difficult to digest. Um, all of them use uh, uh, these uh, proteins as, as storage agents. All of them are very, very difficult for the gut to digest. Uh, we do have proleolendopeptidases, but those are within our synapses. Um, they do not, uh, we don't have anything in our gut that really hydrolyzes uh, uh, these types of proteins very effectively. So they can be very immunologically challenging. And I'll, I'll kind of build a, a story forward on that. Um, I, I hate reading things off of these, but th there's a few of them that I'm gonna, gonna have to do it because they're kind of long. Uh, dietary intake of wheat and cereal grains and the role in inflammation. In this review, we discuss evidence from in vitro and in vivo and human intervention studies that describe how the consumption of wheat, but also other cereal grains can contribute to the manifestation of chronic inflammation and autoimmune disease by increasing intestinal permeability and initiating a pro-inflammatory immune response. So the take home from this, we have great data suggesting that in just about everybody, um, if they consume wheat or wheat-like substances, we can see increases in gut and systemic inflammation in these folks. Not everybody reacts the way a celiac does, not everybody has the same degree of problems,
but we can see some pretty good inflammation from, from uh, ingestion of these foods. Um, uh, tight junctions, intestinal permeability, and autoimmunity. This one is, is really one of my favorite papers. There is growing evidence that increased intestinal permeability, this is when the gut gets damaged, plays a pathological role in various autoimmune diseases, including celiac disease and type 1 diabetes. Therefore, we hypothesize that besides genetic, <clears throat> excuse me, and environmental factors, loss of intestinal barrier function is necessary to develop autoimmune disease. Now, just as an aside, I don't want to give away the, the punchline at the end of the story, but we've had huge success within this paleo diet community at addressing various types of autoimmune disease. And it's really the reason why it didn't go Atkins or Zone or something like that, and why we have a significant number of research institutes that are actually poking around this stuff. The, the gut and autoimmune story is really, really powerful. And what's interesting, though, when you start looking at cardiovascular disease, it's kind of autoimmune. When you look at neurodegenerative disease, it's kind of autoimmune. So we have a really interesting kind of dovetailing of a, a lot of different issues. Um, I'm just going uh, to... Common causes, etiology of autoimmune disease, infection, uh, geography, folks that live at uh, higher latitudes because of low vitamin D levels. And it's not just the vitamin D, it's the whole secosteroid cascade of manufacturing vitamin D that seems to modulate the immune response. So you guys live in Florida, I live in Reno. We live there because of the sun and we, we benefit greatly from that. Uh, physical trauma, like a crushing injury, can also release a lot of proteins into circulation, which can stimulate autoimmune process. But all of these things can be in place, but absent intestinal permeability at some level, and it appears that the individual will not develop autoimmune disease. You need some sort of intestinal barrier breakdown in addition to these processes to get that to happen. Uh, vaccinations are, are interesting. Some of the adjuvants, like Quilaha, is, is a, a product that's used in uh, uh, root beer is, is uh, an immune system stimulant. Um, some people really get weirded out that the idea that nightshades like tomatoes could potentially be immunogenic, but alpha-tomatin is used in certain vaccines as, a, as an immune system adjuvant. So again, we don't have button-tight, perfect, randomized, double-blind, gold standard trials, but from a mechanistic perspective, could tomatoes cause an immunogenic effect? Well, are they used in vaccines? Yes. Why? To cause an immunogenic effect. So we don't have it buttoned up. It's not perfect, but it's at least worth looking at. You wouldn't believe the, uh, the uh, anger that some people throw at this stuff, even though there's a, a credible, and maybe it's wrong. Maybe that's not the issue, but maybe we, you know, it's worth turning that rock over and looking, and it really wouldn't be that hard. Okay, so uh, dietary factors. Those are the folks that uh, cited all that. Um, there's a huge list, uh, so I, I kind of gave up looking. Every autoimmune disease that I have looked at so far and looked for a, a intestinal permeability linkage, I have found it. Now, correlation doesn't mean causation, but it starts getting really, you know, there's some pretty strong suggestion there. So what we've been talking about thus far is the potential of Neolithic foods via immunogenic proteins leading to intestinal permeability and potentially autoimmune disease. Now we're gonna kind of split a little bit and look at how Neolithic foods with immunogenic proteins could potentially lead to gut permeability and insulin resistance, leptin resistance, diabetes. So it's, it's a, kind of a, a way that we can, we can arrive at this same spot or different spots with the, the same input, which again, is very hard to pin down when you're doing the, our, our standard type of uh, uh, medical research, because it's one disease, one problem. And, and uh, that's not always the case. So we're gonna look at gut permeability and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is defined as elevated triglycerides, decreased, decreased HDL cholesterol, insulin resistance, and hypertension, elevated blood pressure. Gerald Reven kind of figured this stuff out in the, the late 1980s. He works with our, our clinic in Rito, really amazing guy. But here's some interesting stuff. Walk you guys through this. If you missed your uh, uh, hepatology volume 49, issue six, I've got it right here. Um, increased intestinal permeability and tight junction alterations in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Conclusions. 
Our results provide the first evidence that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in humans is associated with increased gut permeability and that this abnormality is related to the increased prevalence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, bacteria growing in the wrong place at the wrong time in these patients. The increased permeability appears to be caused by a disruption of intracellular tight junctions. That was the story with the, the gluten peptides and whatnot in the intestines, and it may play an important role in the pathogenesis of hepatic fat deposition. Do you know what one of the fastest growing uh, morbidity mortalities among youth is currently? Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease necessitating a liver transplant. These kids are developing fatty livers and dying from it because there's inadequate uh, transplant. And this is completely dietary driven. Um, and we'll, we, we should have some pretty good uh, ideas about how to, um, to address this. So now, there's this stuff called lipopolysaccharide. This is, and this is, gets a little technical, but this is about as technical as we're gonna get. Has anybody heard of someone going into septic shock? Yeah. So what happens are these things, gram-negative bacteria, and they release these, these molecules, uh, some of them called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and we don't know why, but every vertebrate species on the planet, if they get lipopolysaccharide in their circulation, that organism freaks out. It goes into hypovolemic shock, blood glucose shoots up, fatty acids are released, it just goes crazy. And uh, it's a really consistently conserved process across all animals, all, all vertebrates. But what lipopolysaccharide does is it activates an innate immune system response in human adipose tissue it, it basically, it, so the, the takeaway from their, their results again, our suggest, su results suggest that type 2 diabetes mellitus is associated with increased endotoxemia. Basically what they're saying, if we look at type 2 diabetic individuals, we see elevated levels of endotoxemia, elevated levels of intestinal permeability, elevated levels of LPS. So again, correlative, not causative, but let's build a mechanistic story for how that, how elevated LPS could actually bring about that state of metabolic derangement. Sepsis-induced changes in pancreatic hormone secretion, extreme insulin resistance tepifies the septic patient. A septic patient and a poorly controlled type 2 diabetic, if you have them side by side, you really cannot tell them apart it, for most of the lab work. They look almost identical. And the reason why is that the sepsis state is causing essentially an uncontrolled type 2 diabetics uh, phenomena. Uh, Journal of Leukocyte Biology, insulin resistance characterizes the septic patient and it seems that the balance between insulin and its counter-regulatory hormones, cortisol, glucagon, and growth hormone is perturbed in the metabolic response to sepsis. During type 2 diabetes, typically, we are overfed and we are awash in energy. The person is usually overweight, but yet they're hungry, and without an insulin dose to bring their, their glucagon back down. Glucagon, insulin tends to put nutrients into the liver and into our cells. Glucagon causes a release of uh, fats and glucose out of the liver and out of the body. But in the type two diabetic, they have tons of energy, but the brain and the liver aren't communicating. They think they're starving, so the body ramps up the release of glucose out of the liver, and this is where blood glucose levels can get six, seven, eight hundred. It's not from dietary sources. It's from our own liver because the communication is broken. And this is what's happening in the septic environment. It seems that one of the metabolic problems during sepsis is an inability to use free fatty acids as a metabolic substrate. This is very common in elevated insulin levels. The liver's function as a regulator of glycemia is also disturbed as a result of hepatic insulin resistance. This results in increased hepatic glucose output, what we just talked about, where you can get a blood glucose level of 600 and not eat a thing because it comes out of your own, your own liver, initially as a result of glycogenolysis, but later from gluconeogenesis, the conversion of proteins into, into sugar, basically. It's gonna be a little crude, but have you noticed that folks that have type two diabetes, they don't have much backside? Type two diabetes is a wasting disease. It's a wasting disease because during blood sugar lows, the body looks for anything it can catabolize, anything it can eat to turn into glucose. And what it does is catabolizes the muscle mass. What do we usually store within our muscles? Glucose. 
So as this diabetic that can't control their blood sugar loses their muscle mass, they have less and less ability to store glucose. And it gets worse and worse. Do y'all remember the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Old suspension bridge, wind would blow over it and would shake. It hits a resin at some point and then everything breaks. And this is where the wheels fall off the wagon. Muscles become insulin resistant. Free fatty acids are released by the adipose tissue. And this again is while everything is already really high, we have tons of energy circulating. We don't need any of this to be happening, but this is what happens in both the septic state and in the uncontrolled type two diabetic state. The liver perceives low blood sugar, even though it's high, because we're insulin resistant. Cortisol is released because if we're on low blood sugar, then we're stressed, so we release cortisol. The cortisol releases li uh, lipids and glucose, further elevating the problem. Inflammatory signaling ramps up. So everything that leads to uh, atherosclerotic lesions, um, uh, immune suppression is ramped up. High levels of blood glucose, free fatty acids, and tissue insulin resistance ensue. Uh, the liver becomes backlogged with glucose and glycogen, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Synthesis of VLDLs increase. These, uh, this leads into the small, dense LDL lipoproteins that are, are very atherogenic. They, like I said, the VLDL, the pattern B cholesterol, uh, systemic inflammation increases. Uh, appetite signaling is lost. So during all this process, people are awash in nutrients, but yet they're still hungry, ravenously hungry. Uh, blood sugars swing from high to low. Fat cannot really be adequately accessed for fuel because we're, we're so profoundly insulin resistant. So uh, dyslipidemia and inflammation and evolutionarily conserved mechanism. <clears throat> inflammation leads to changes in lipid metabolism ranged at decreasing the toxicity of various harmful agents. Tissues repair, uh, and, and tissues repaired by redistributing nutrients to cells involved with host defense. Acute phase responses mediated by cytokines, these are chemical messengers that all of our cells release, preserves the host from acute injury. When the inflammation becomes chronic, it, leads, uh, uh, it might lead to chronic disorders such as atherosclerosis and metabolic syndrome. So what this paper is talking about, this is LPS. This is that gnarly stuff that comes off of a gram-negative bacteria like E. coli. When that gets into circulation, it raises all kinds of problems. But it's re really interestingly, LDL cholesterol, everybody's called LDL cholesterol the bad cholesterol. Everybody's familiar with that? LPS binding protein circulates in association with ApoB containing lipoproteins and enhances endotoxin VLDL-LDL interaction. Let me show you this. So if LPS enters the system and it is able to uh, connect itself to an immune cell, then it creates a feed-forward cascade of inflammation that leads into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and a whole host of problems. It's really, really nasty. But if LPS binds to lipoprotein binding protein, and then that get, gets taken up by either an HDL or also LDLs can play a role in this, then the LPS is effectively neutralized. And here's an interesting side note. People with high cholesterol levels who develop infections or sepsis are much more likely to su survive those events than people with low cholesterol. Now it begs the question, what's, what, what's the right range to have? And there's a whole host of factors on that. But I wanna, I wanna throw one piece out here that is really interesting. My clinic mainly does lipidology. I'm not a lipidologist, but I, I help them on some of the functional medicine stuff. I think if you get a blood test and it just has HDL, LDL, uh, total cholesterol and triglycerides, it is almost worthless. What it will do is confuse you and it will not answer a damn thing that is of value in my opinion. It, it is it, uh, borderline negligent at this point. Okay, so we have two people that could look identical. We've got an LDL-C, LDL cholesterol of 100, LDL cholesterol of 100. The cholesterol is a passenger. The LDL particles are the vehicles that they drive around in, okay? So we could have an LDLC of, a, of 100, LDLC of 100. If we have large, uh, fluffy um, vehicles, 
We can carry a ton of cholesterol, but have very few vehicles on the road. If we have small, dense vehicles zipping around, we could have the same cholesterol number, numbers, but the particle count here could be 1,000. The particle count here could be 3,000. Okay, now from our va these are the things that circulate in our vascular bed. Now we'll, we'll do a little thought experiment. If we were just driving Vespas around a closed loop and we had 100 of them on the track or 3,000 of them on the track, which situation might more accidents and chaos occur? <laughs> it's a gradient dri driven process. And, and, and that's not the whole story, <clears throat> but there are a ton of people that look like they have high cholesterol levels, but they have low lipoprotein talent. Conversely, and this is particularly true in police, military, and fire, and shift workers, these people will look like they have low normal cholesterol levels, but they have this sky-high lipoprotein count. These are the people that die from a heart attack at 35 or 40. This is the triathlete firefighter who's been doing shift work for eight years and dies of a cardiac event. And the standard blood work is failing these people. And a simple lipoprotein count, like what they do through LabCorp and, and a few other people are doing, can discover this immediately and we can do immediate intervention, both dietary and pharmacological, to, to send that thing in a different direction. So back to uh, uh, the endotoxemia really quick. Has everybody heard of metformin? It's a glucose lowering drug. It's really interesting because not only does it lower glucose, it also repairs the gut. Metformin prevents endotoxin induced liver injury after a partial hep uh, hepectomy. Basically they remove part of the liver and uh, gave these animals um, metformin and it reduced the amount of inflammation that they would have received from the uh, LPS exposure. So metformin is really interesting in that it addresses elements that we would see in elevated blood glucose by sensitizing the muscles, by lowering glucose output in the liver, and it also heals the gut. It minimizes gut permeability. So it's addressing multiple factors within the, the mechanism of, of a metabolic derangement. Um, let's see here, we're getting close, I promise. Uh, so, so what I was trying to, to drive at here is that um, certain proteins can have pharmacological activity within our bodies, okay? And uh, the extracellular domain of human leptin receptor contains 20 glycosylation points, 20 binding points that we found that mammalian cells exposed to concannabinoid A or wheat germaglutinin it, it, uh, it, it bound to the leptin receptor site. So this is my long circuitous way of getting back to that question of can these Neolithic foods, these evolutionarily novel foods, epidemiologically we seem to have some suggestion that they're a problem. We have some interventions on both an animal model and a human model. But then the question was, well, are these things even biologically active? Do they do produce a pharmacological activity? And they do, I'll share one more with you. Gluten X orphan B5 stimulates prolactin secretion through opioid receptors located outside the blood brain barrier. Gluten X orphan B5 is a food derived opioid protein identified in digestive wheat. We've recently shown that GEB5 stimulates prolactin secretion through opioid receptors outside the blood brain barrier. Since opioid peptides do not exert the role on the uh, prolactin secretion directly, but via reduced dopamine and energic tone, our data suggests that GEB5 can modify brain neurotransmitter release without crossing the blood brain barrier. So it has pharmacological activity. It has pharmacological activity both inside and outside the brain. So this stuff can affect any organ, any system. And uh, this kind of brings us back around. We started with an observation. We got into clinical uh, ob observations work towards a mechanistic theory, and I feel like we have a pretty solid mechanistic theory here. But, comparison with ancestral diets suggests dense acellular carbohydrate, processed carbohydrate, promotes an inflammatory gut microbiota. Everything I just told you about lectins, I think is true, but there's another layer to it, which is that if and when we process our carbohydrates, it causes the virtually same responses that we just looked at, particularly on the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, not necessarily with some of the elements of specific proteins activating like the prolactin receptors and things like that, 
But my point here is that asking these questions are great. We can build our way forward, but then we get slammed, uh, wet fish across the top of the head with something like, like this paper that looks very, very similar and very synergistic to what we're talking about. But it's also pretty consistent with what Stefan Lindeberg's original contention was, was that westernized diets were somehow problematic. And it's that refining of the carbohydrate that is likely a, a big issue. And one, one quick final thing, um, I just pulled this up. There was, there was a day and time when anybody doing any type of uh, immunological research looking at gut permeability, if you suggested gut permeability, they were laughed out of town. Um, that's, in, in this, in, in any computer you put it on, you, you get this pulled up. That, it's the hottest area of immunological research. Um, anything else huge? Nope, because Ken is telling me I am out of time. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you really quick, really, really quick. Um, when I got to, got to Reno, Nevada, um, I started working with a the clinic. They were right at the end of a, a two-year pilot study. We had 33 participants. Uh, the program cost $1,000 per participant. We found cops and firefighters at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, got them on a paleo diet, modified their sleep, got them exercising as best we could. The program savings are estimated to be $22 million prorated over uh, 10 years, not 20, with a very conservative 33 to 1 return on investment. Now, I'm going to do a little whining bit here. I spent five years trying to scale this thing and turn it into a, a company that was going to change healthcare. But because of the structure of the Affordable Care Act, it doesn't work. And so I am pissed. <laughs> okay, um, thank you all for coming. I have, a, I have a story behind cows eat grass. If you want to talk to me about that, then we'll, we'll talk later. Okay, thank you. A cool. little over. Okay, so question and answer. I believe a gentleman up here. Thank you. Um, it's been reported that 75% of SAD, or the standard American diet, is pro-chronic inflammation. Many of us are trying to minimize that with probiotics. The word is now that probiotics just don't escape the gastric uses and are really ineffective. But I see that your recommendations are what they call a pre-probiotic. Right. Would you talk about that, please? Yeah, and you know, I, I think that probiotics are probably still beneficial. There's a couple of products like Prescriptasis that they use, um, HSOs, homeostatic soil organisms. These are, are organisms that actually make cysts and they live out in the soil and this is what we would have been eating normally and they've found a lot of these to be pretty beneficial for different gut issues. But eating fermented foods, a variety of uh, uh, non-digestible fibers like resistant starch and then rotating through uh, probiotics, I think is a fantastic way to, to shore that up, yeah. Hey Rob, before we go to the next question, uh, as the talk ends, we only have a few more questions. We should head out the door up here where Alan is because we've got uh, a lot going on back here right now and we'd all be sort of in the way. So we should go out where Alan is standing up there. It'll take us an extra minute to get out, but it'll, it'll help people back here. We have one here. Uh, during the break, or our interruption, I ask Rob, um, I'm, I'm currently getting metabolic panels and CBC levels tested. Um, what should we ask for from our primary physician for blood work? And Rob suggested uh, the LPPC, and that was the lipoprotein particle count. Yep. And that, I'm not sure if my physician would know how to read it if I ask for it, but uh, I think we're hearing that we need to go back and ask for that to be part of our blood panel. Absolutely. That should absolutely be part of your base blood panel. And probably in five years, it will be standard of care because the current blood work, it, they're putting people on statins that shouldn't be, and then there are people who should be getting intervention who are not. And I think this gentleman right back here... I've read, I've read books and articles that claim, depending upon your blood type, it should determine what foods you eat. Does that have any basis in reality? Um, I'm going to answer that indirectly with a, a weird observation that the uh, palm reader in Chico, California, where we used to have our gym, it didn't matter whether it was an economic implosion or explosion, she was always in business. Yeah. Can tell he's fine. 
the gentleman back behind there. You're welcome. In your first book, you had a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, people that really benefited from the paleo Sorry, guys. be laughed out of a doctor's office. Right. Uh, that was six years ago. It's that changed a lot. Now. It's changed a lot. Well, I mean, like, uh, the clinic that I'm on the board of directors of in Reno, Nevada, we do work with police, military, and fire all over the world. We work with the local community, and we are an evolutionary medicine clinic. I mean, that's what we do. And so even, and it was crazy. I showed up in Reno, Nevada. Like, wait, wait, I had no idea those guys were there. We, my wife and I were going to stay in Reno for a year. And then I got hooked up with them, and I've been working on this project since then. Um, the uh, Cleveland Clinic is now training all their doctors in, in functional medicine, which essentially the dietary protocol is an ancestral type diet, which isn't necessarily high carb or low carb, but it's, it's thinking about in, potentially immunogenic foods that could cause problems and then match things to you appropriately. And is the gentleman still here who asked about the, the blood type deal or did I chase him off? Oh, you are still here. I, I didn't mean to totally brush that off, but it, it, there's not a lot of science behind it. Okay. Yeah, no, no. yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and did, did I... So, so it's much better. It's an entirely different environment. And again, you know, it's really growing exponentially. The biggest challenge I found after my book was a lack of practitioners. And I spent a lot of money creating a website called the Paleo Physicians Network just as a clearinghouse to try to get patients and practitioners together. And, and it was pretty good, but now all that stuff has taken off. One more question. Yeah. One more. Um, I, gentleman over there. Sorry, sorry. I, you're close. I'll, I'll grab you as we go out. <laughs> There's overwhelming evidence that introducing newborns and infants to a wide variety of bacteria and bacterial toxins improves gut health and immune response. Can we not say the same about food? There's certainly evidence that maybe we should be introducing a wide variety of foods earlier, uh, and again, for the same reason. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's really interesting. So um, there's some suggestion that early exposure to wheat or wheat-like products, dairy or soy, can mitigate the risk of allergies and, and uh, type 1 diabetes. But there's also indications that uh, avoiding exposure to these substances completely negate the likelihood of developing type, two, type 1 diabetes later, this, this uh, childhood onset uh, diabetes. I have no idea what the story is with that. There's so many moving parts. We've got a genetic component, the epigenetic component of the gut, and then the epigenetic component of the actual food. And I have no idea what to, to make of that. Um, with my own daughters, I've generally, they've eaten pretty much paleo. We do a little bit of gluten-free pizza here and there. I've largely fed them gluten-free. Part of the reason is that if I get a gluten exposure, whatever bathroom I hit is going to be bricked over, decommissioned. You'll need a priest to, like, it's done. It'll never be used again. And so I don't want it in the house. Um, but when they've been out to eat with friends, they've gotten some exposures here and there, and it doesn't seem to bother them. But it didn't bother me as a kid. It really destroyed me after I caught Giardia in Central America. And then it, it really turned on. But I mean, it's a great question. And I don't think anybody has good answers yet on it at all. Okay, I think that's it. On that, that was... image, uh, let's thank our Thank you. Yeah. yeah.